Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wind Electricity Primer Course, uh, brought to you by the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. I'm Jenny Heinzen. I'm the Curriculum and Training Coordinator here at the MREA. Uh, Clay Sterling and myself did most of the work on this particular presentation that you're going to be seeing, and Chris Talbot Heindel is our reviewer. This primer course is going to introduce you to the concept of wind electricity, the really basics of wind electricity. You'll learn some definitions, how wind energy systems work, and how wind systems can add to the value of a home or a business. So we'll have some terms and definitions and classifications to talk about when we get started. And then we'll, we're going to talk quite a bit about wind turbine parts, you know, what, what all makes a wind energy system. The generators, the tails, the collectors, or uh, the rotor blades as we tend to call them, and and uh, of course the towers that we put these machines on. And we'll have a couple basic sighting tips for you and we'll end our course here with a field trip, so to speak, a virtual field trip out to the three turbines at the MREA. Let's start with some basic definitions. First of all, the grid, or the utility, is a network of wires that run up and down the streets and highways of the U.S., right? So the way that our, our power generation and distribution system works in the United States is we tend to have large centralized power plants, whether they're coal or natural gas or nuclear power or maybe even a wind farm or a biodigester of sorts. But if it's making a whole lot of power, megawatts and gigawatts, then it's going to go out on very high voltage transmission lines. Through there, once it gets through the transmission lines, it goes through what we call a substation, which is just basically a collection of transformers that change the voltage from a very high voltage that you saw on the transmission lines, like 200 or 500,000 volts. We'll step that down to something on what we call a distribution level. So this, these are distribution lines. These are the ones that are connecting eventually through another smaller transformer and into your home or to your small business or to your farm. We're going to talk about power quite a bit. So power is measured in watts. When you take electrical voltage and you take that times the current, which is measured in amps, you get power, watts. It indicates the amount of power that a wind turbine can produce at a particular wind speed, or we also use it, of course, to talk about how much power that a device or a load uses. For example, my computer that's running right now is a load, and so it's using some power. A kilowatt, then, is just a uh, metric prefix for a thousand watts. So if we say we have a 20 kilowatt machine, we're talking about 20,000 watts. And again, that would be at a particular wind speed. It doesn't mean the wind turbine would ma always make 20 kW. It means at a certain wind speed it will produce 20 kW. And in between there, it could produce any other number, uh, 20 kW or less. So then there's a difference between power, again, which was just a watt or a kilowatt, versus energy, a kilowatt hour. Notice that we've put the, the hour at the end, which means we've put time into the equation. So this is when you take the power and you look at how much of that power you're using over time, that's energy. This is the unit in which you buy and sell electricity. So when you get your electrical bill at the end of the month, you are charged by how many kilowatt hours you use that month. So it, it indicates again over time uh, how much you use or in the case of wind turbines uh, how much it produces over time. So when you take volts times amps times the hours and again because of the metric prefix kilo times a thousand you get a kilowatt hour. So for example on the blue box on the bottom here I've got a uh, hundred watts say you had an old-fashioned uh, incandescent light bulb in the basement or something and it was rated at a hundred watts and you had that on for three hours, you'd use 300 watt hours, or convert that by moving the imaginary decimal point here at the end of 300, scoot that over three places, and you find yourself with 0.3 kilowatt hours. So saying 0.3 kilowatt hours is the same as saying 300 watt hours. Just have to play with the prefix there. So it, it really is important to understand the difference between power and energy and not get the concepts mixed up and certainly not get the measurement mixed up either because there's a difference, a, a big difference between watts, which is power. Think of that as like the speedometer in your car. You've got the ability to go from zero miles an hour up to, well, <laughs> depending on what kind of a car you have, uh, up to 260 on this particular uh, picture. So it doesn't mean that you're always going at 260. It, it means that you've got the potential. To, to go anywhere in here. Energy, therefore, is a little bit more like your odometer, and it's looking at, you know, what your mileage is over time, how many miles you've put on. You know, some of them were at 25 miles an hour, some of them were at 55 miles an hour, and maybe some of them were more. So that's, that's you know, it's a rate kind of a thing. Think of power as a rate, and think of energy as uh, consumption or production over time. 
Okay, when we talk about wind turbines, we need to know one of the first questions, if someone wants a wind turbine on the property, we have to know what your, at least have a good idea, about what your average annual wind speed is. It's very typical that we get uh, comments like, well, it's always windy here. I live in the windiest part of the county. I'm on the top of a hill. The wind's always blowing. Well, we want to make sure that there actually is a, a viable wind resource there, and it's not just some sort of a breeze that you happen to be feeling, you know, on a fluke. So we want an average annual wind speed. 12 months worth of data determined by, again, there's a couple different methods of determining this, and if you take our wind site assessment course here at the MRA, you can learn all the proper ways. But a really easy way is to record using an anemometer, a device that measures wind speed. So for example, here at the MREA, we've got some anemometers mounted on one of our towers. One's at 86 feet, one's at 66 feet, and the third's at 46 feet. So uh, as we collected data throughout the years, we, we noticed that the wind, the average annual wind speed, notice here how it increases with height, right? We have better wind speeds as we get higher up on the machine. Keep that in mind when we talk about siding and towers and how important that is. Uh, the amount of energy that you're going to produce is, is basically a function of your wind speed. It's actually the cube of your wind speed, so it's really, really important. So we need to know, again, or at least have a good idea of what an average annual wind speed would be at the site. Something that, that people get confused about quite a bit, and understandably so, is that wind turbine manufacturers will name their machine yet in a power rating, the, a rated output or a nameplate rating, for example, 20 kilowatts. A manufacturer will say that their machine is a 20 kilowatt machine or a 10 kilowatt machine or a 2.5 kilowatt machine. And that again has to be coupled with a wind speed. It's not always going to produce, you know, much like your speedometer in your car, right? It's not always going to produce a certain amount of power. It's going to vary. And in our case, of course, it's going to vary with the wind speeds. So it is sort of a buyer beware. Don't get get played by marketing, by some machine just saying, hey, this is a 20 kilowatt machine. It doesn't even suggest necessarily how much energy that system's going to produce for you. We need to know, again, of course, what your wind speed is, and there's a lot of other factors at play. But you can't just judge a turbine by its nameplate rating. It's it's really just a nominal a name that a manufacturer gives it. And there's a lot more to say on this topic, but not in the primer course. <laughs> Whether or not a turbine is certified or goes through the same, you know, standards as, say, for example, solar panels. That's a whole other topic for another day. But just beware that it is a, a name given by the manufacturer. So, for example, a, a Berge XL1, which is rated as a one kilowatt machine, right? One kilowatt equals a thousand watts. That machine makes its one kilowatt when the power is 24.6, you know, right around 25 miles an hour. And that's a standard that we use in the industry to compare apples to apples, roughly that, that 25 mile per hour uh, wind speed. So here is what we call a power curve for that Berge XL1. Again, this is a, a one kilowatt machine. So notice according to this power curve here, it's making a thousand. This is from a school, actually. This is their own uh, power curve here. It's been adjusted. Uh, so it's making 1,000 watts here right around 30 miles per hour. Okay, So this is very typical of what you would see on just about any wind turbine power curve that of course when the wind speeds are zero miles per hour you are making zero watts or zero, zero kilowatts, right? As the wind speeds increase and you get up to 10, 20, 30 miles per hour of course the output of the machine is going to increase and then you'll notice that it plateaus, it levels off, it might even drop off completely depending on the design of the machine. We don't want the wind to get too crazy out of hand and still have a machine that's spinning in it. So in just a little while we're going to talk about speed control and governing in ways that turbines uh, shut themselves down to protect themselves in case of really high wind speeds. So this is again very typical power curve. I'm just picking on the Berge. I'm not, you know, saying one machine's better than the other by any means, but this is a, a very common machine, a small machine that you may see around. Okay, net metering. Again, we could probably go into this for a lot longer than the next three minutes, but by definition, net metering means that any investor-owned utility uh, is required by law to buy and sell electricity to its customers at the same rates. So in other words, if you had a distributed generation system like a small wind turbine or an array of solar electric PV panels, up to a certain amount of that system, the utility is required to give you credit for the amount of extra electricity that you produce and, and they're supposed to give you retail rate for that or at least credit for that retail rate. 
So say for example in the case of, of wind, you've got typically winter time uh, is pretty windy uh, in the Midwest. So say you rack up a whole lot of kilowatt hours on your wind machine, more than you know your home maybe even needs. Maybe you're overproducing, you're going over how many kilowatt hours you've used in those months. According to net metering laws, you should be able to sort of keep a tally and, and roll over those extra credits and use them up then during the summer months when you're maybe you're using a little bit more electricity because you've got an air conditioner going and at the same time the wind speeds have decreased on a monthly average uh, so you can kind of rack up some credits and then use those credits that's that's what net metering is all about and it varies by state I want to take you to a website here that I've listed it's it's a great one to mark as uh, one of your favorites or as a bookmark here desireusa.org run out of University of North Carolina updated very very regularly always up-to-date information uh, just as an example something you would find off of their website here is for each and I just picked on the Midwestern states a few of us what that cap is for net metering policies you know if you're looking in, at Iowa the net metering cap is 500 kilowatts so you could buy a wind turbine with a nameplate rating up to 500 kilowatts and by law your investor owned utility would be required to pay you the same retail rate for your electricity that you produce with that wind turbine as what you normally pay them for the electricity that you buy. So, you know, Iowa's a terrific example of a really fabulous net metering law. And then where I'm sitting in Wisconsin right now, we're at 20 kW. So if you were to buy a wind machine rated 20 kW, or for that matter, um, a PV system rated for 20 kW or less, and you wanted to interconnect with the grid, and you are working with an investor-owned utility, you should fall under the net metering law. So let's take a look at the website desireusa.org and it is extremely user-friendly. All you have to do is click on whichever state you're interested in. If you want some federal policies like buyback rates and incentives, that's of course a, an option up here. It's always at the top of the page. No matter which state you pick, you can still click on any of the federal uh, incentives and paperwork and interconnection requirements and all that kind of good stuff. But much of this is done on a state-by-state -state level. So if you just kind of look through again, you can see the different things you can get off this website. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Different grants, loan programs, and rebates that are out there. What were we looking for again? Oh yeah, that's right. We were looking for our net metering policy. So here it is, for Wisconsin this is anyway, net metering, commercial, industrial, residential, there's our 20 kilowatt cap. Some utilities allow net metering for systems up to 100 kilowatts, so again, you as a customer would want to see which utility, of course, that is and whether or not you qualify. So a whole bunch of other, you know, if you wanted to get into public service dockets and, and other sort of geeky fun things like that. That's always an option from this website as well. But wanted to show you that it is, again, probably one of the resources I use most often. Okay, something that is talked about quite a bit in the wind world is the Betts Limit, or Betts Law. Albert Betts from 1926, uh, the rotor of a wind machine can convert only a fraction of the kinetic energy uh, of the wind into mechanical energy. The best rotor efficiency we can hope for is about 60%. So in other words, think back to basic physics, energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transferred from one form into another, and that's what Betts Law is all about, that the energy from the wind can only be transferred transferred to mechanical energy uh, efficiency, if, if that's what you like to call it anyway, the, the best you can get is 59.3%. So any company that claims that their rotor is 70% efficient, <laughs> you should probably be a little suspect. By definition, there are small wind energy systems, or I should say by classification, there are small wind energy systems and then there are large wind energy systems. And for most states and most policies and most standards and most testing facilities, that line is drawn at 100 kilowatts. So any machine that's 100 kilowatts or less, for example, this is a picture of a North Wind 100, any machine this size or smaller is uh, considered a small wind energy system. So anything basically from a three foot to a 69 foot rotor diameter. This is a Berge uh, 1.5 kilowatt machine. Again, this is a 100 kilowatt machine, so there's lots of differences, of course, between the two machines, but they're both still considered small. Uh, obviously, then anything larger than 100 kilowatts, like wind farm equipment, is considered large, right?
And there are horizontal axis wind turbines, which are most common, and then there's also something we'll talk about in just a moment called vertical axis wind turbines. Uh, but the horizontal axis wind turbines are the good wind turbines. The spinning rotor is on a horizontal shaft, and this turbine, again, just the conventional three-bladed machine, sometimes two, but most often three-bladed machine, needs to be mounted on a tall tower. It does not get mounted on a roof, it does not get mounted on a short pole. All of the certified, I'll say legendary, or well-known, well-established, good wind turbines, kilowatt hour producing machines, they are horizontal axis turbines. And there's lots of talk and, and lots of buzz and lots of interneting about vertical axis wind turbines. And, and some have been tested and some are still undergoing uh, tests, but uh, to date there just aren't any certified kilowatt hour producing vertical axis machines on the market. On a vertical axis or a watt, the uh, the spinning rotor is on a vertical shaft. It's usually mounted to a short tower or no tower. One of the problems with the vertical axis wind turbine is that it's very hard to get the rotor going in low wind speeds. And once it is going, it's very hard to control during high wind speeds. And because of the fact, if you remember just a few slides ago, we talked about how wind speeds increased with height. We had some anemometer readings from the MREA here at 86 feet and 66 feet and then at 46 feet. And we could see through that data that, that the wind speeds increased with height, right? So down here at the bottom of this vertical axis, you're, you're going to be getting one particular wind speed, whereas the fuel coming up to the top of this rotor is going to be a little bit of a higher wind speed. Not much, but still, if you're running everything, you're spinning on one continuous uh, vertical shaft, it's going to be hard to get away from having high stresses and high fatigue dealing with the fact that there's different wind speeds hitting the rotor at the same time. So uh, just to date, these have had very high fail rates. Not to say there won't ever be a vertical axis turbine out there that performs well, but just to date, that that's the case. And even worse, rooftop turbines. For many reasons, the rooftop is not a good place to put a wind turbine. I'll say never put a, a, a turbine on a rooftop. It's attractive to some people because they think, oh, look, no tower. I don't have to uh, deal with permits in the town about, you know, putting a tower in and getting a crane in and having, you know, concrete. I can just mount these puppies on the roof. The problem with wind on rooftops is that it's very turbulent wind. It's not what pilots would refer to as laminar wind. Nice, straight, like a jet stream, which is what we want. That's where the fuel is at. Uh, turbulent wind really just wreaks havoc on the mechanicals of the machine. Uh, shakes, rattles, and rolls. Not to mention the fact that it's mounted to a building, so therefore the foundation of the building and the structure of the building itself can also tend to shake and rattle a bit. It causes vibrations and some noises and some stresses, and I've heard lots of crazy stories from people about what have you know the results have been of, of mounting turbines on rooftops and again I, I rarely use the word never but in this case I'll repeat never put a wind turbine on a rooftop okay let's move on to the machines themselves and what's all included in wind energy system number one of course you'll need an electrical generator if you want to produce any power or energy uh, tails. We'll talk about tails. Some machines have them, some don't. The collector, of course, would be the spinning part of the machine, the rotor, where the, the blades are attached. And then finally, again, it's very important that we have a tower to put this machine on. So there's low-speed machines and high-speed machines. Let's talk about each. A low-speed machine, often referred to as a heavy-duty machine, again, these are all small wind turbines here, uh, they run at a relatively low RPM, and they're called heavy-duty because their parts are actually a little bit more heavy. They've got more weight due to more magnets and more, more coils of wire. They're relatively low maintenance. Uh, because they're heavy-duty, they're usually packed pretty well and sealed pretty well and, and, and pretty rugged, uh, have a pretty good long life, but because of their really fantastic construction and, and heavy duty and, and lots of magnet uh, construction, they do have a high upfront cost or a higher uh, upfront cost associated with them. So if you don't like the idea of a heavy duty machine and some big heavy solid parts, you can always go for a light duty machine, lighter, cheaper, faster. That's exactly, just kind of summed it up there, what, what the light duty machines are about. They are lighter, therefore they are cheaper. Um, there's not as much wire, maybe, you know, not as many magnets, lighter weight, runs really fast though at a high speed, uh, lighter, cheaper, faster. So don't expect the same life expectancy out of a light duty machine as you would a heavy duty machine. Okay, And uh, high maintenance meaning <laughs> there, there may be times where you'll have to replace parts on the machine. Keep your eye on it, especially during high wind events.
Okay, so there is direct drive and then there are gear driven machines. All right, so direct drive means that there's very few moving parts, there are a few wear points, so therefore it's it's pretty low maintenance. But the thing about direct drive, uh, as you may assume through the name, is that the, the, the generator here, the electrical generator, is going to be going at the same speed as the rotor because they are coupled directly to each other. The generator is basically a part of the rotor, so that is what we call a direct drive versus a machine that's gear driven where there's actually a gearbox in between the rotor, the spinning part, and the shaft. The shaft actually goes into a gearbox first and then from that gearbox the generator behind it will be spinning at a faster rate. And it depends on the gearbox, what we call the gearbox ratio. Think of this almost like the, the transmission in your car, you know, kind of automatically shifting. There are lots of moving parts in these systems because you've just added a whole a whole bunch of different components into into the picture. So there's there's a lot more wear parts and moving parts. It requires maintenance. This is at least twice a year. I'll climb up there and, and check everything out and, and add grease and lube and, and check as needed. The generator then that you can't see because it's nestled here underneath what we call the nacelle, N-A-C-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, it's French. So inside of this nacelle is again first the gearbox and then the generator. The generator will be running at a faster speed speed than the rotor, right? So what you're seeing happening on the outside here, like for every full rotation on the rotor here, the generator is actually going to be spinning faster. You know, if it's a, uh, it might be twice as fast, it might be 50 times as fast. It totally depends on the machine. So that's a gear driven uh, wind turbine. So the variable speed machines then, these are to be the ones that are like direct drive and they're permanent magnet alternators. There, There's actually magnets located inside of, of the alternator itself here. The rotor speed changes with the wind speed. That's why we call it variable speed, right? So as the wind speeds pick up, so does the speed of the rotor. What happens electrically speaking then is that the wires uh, are going to come down the tower. In this case, they're inside of the tower, right? They're going to come down the tire as what we, uh, down the tower as uh, what we refer to as quote unquote wild, three phase AC. And by wild, we don't mean uncontrolled. We just mean the fact that it, it could be anywhere from zero volts to you know maybe a couple hundred volts. It depends on the wind speed, the frequency of the electricity of the alternating current might be real low because the wind speeds are low, it might be real high because the wind speeds are high. So this comes down the tower as kind of an unusable three-phase wild AC voltage and frequency and therefore power. So what we have to do is put that through a device called an inverter and that inverter is going to take care of cleaning up the voltage and the frequency and the power so that it can be connected into the electricity that you're using in your home at the same voltage and the same frequency and the same 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 everything. So any sort of a variable speed machine you'll need to install an inverter along with it to get that electricity usable. That's a little bit different than some wind turbines that use induction generators and are therefore constant speed machines. Some small wind turbines have them, uh, some large wind turbines have them. It's all over the industry. Um, some are variable speeds, some are induction generators. One isn't really better than the other. They're just two different types of doing it, right? So an induction generator, or uh, if you want to be fancy about it, asynchronous generator, has to be connected to the electrical grid in order to operate. You don't need an inverter to change any sort of wild three-phase AC coming down the tower, because in this case, it's the electricity, the voltage and the frequency from the grid, sort of, it's, it's connected at the base of the tower uh, through the electrical controls, but that's the signal that tells the generator up here that we're ready to produce some electricity. It's, it's what we call the field winding or the, the energizing winding of the generator and, and what allows it to go in the first place. So it's, it's a little bit of a different type of machine, obviously, than a permanent magnet machine is. And the nice thing about induction generators is they're off-the-shelf components. A lot of motors that you use in your everyday loads are induction motors, so by design that's really the same machine as an induction generator. What you're going to notice about these machines is that the rotor is always spinning at the same speed, uh, as long as there actually is wind out there, as long as you've got a resource and there actually is measurable wind speeds. Whether it's 10 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour, you're going to notice that the rotor is going the same speed. And that's again because it is an induction generator. Here's the innards of that machine we were just looking at. This is an Endurance S250 series. So uh, the hub of the machine is right here. You can see this is where we would uh, attach the three blades. Right, so this is basically the front of the machine, if you will. 
okay, the collector. Here's the vertical shaft. You can't really see it from right behind this point, but it goes through the disc brake. That's how we stop the machine here. These are pneumatic disc brakes. But here's your, ver uh, excuse me, your horizontal shaft, right? So as the collector is spinning, there's the shaft that spins. And it goes back here to the back of the machine. Here's your gearbox. Okay, so your gearbox is going to change whatever speed this is going at, ramp it up, make it go a little bit faster. Uh, the gearbox ratio is determined through the gearbox. And that's what spins this big blue guy here, which is your induction generator. All right, so a uh, constant speed machine. Again, the way that this machine controls itself and stops itself is with a disc brake that's pneumatically uh, air-driven. So very unique machine, very cool machine. We like it. Let's talk about tails. If a small wind machine has a tail, it is an upwind machine. Just like the wind vane or the rooster on the top of the barn, uh, as the wind direction changes, the little rooster spins around, right? And tells you which way the wind's blowing. That's the same concept here as an upwind wind turbine. Uh, just by design, it will passively, the tail will orient it so that it's facing into the wind. All right, An upwind machine means it's facing into the wind. If you've got a very small wind turbine and it has no tail, one of two things are happening. Most commonly, it means that it's a downwind machine. It means that now, instead of the rotor facing into the wind, the rotor is going to face out of the wind. So imagine in both of these pictures here, our, our wind is coming basically like from west to east. So our wind is traveling this way. On an upwind machine, they'll be facing into the wind. On a downwind machine, it's facing out of the wind. And just like all these other options we've been talking about with generator types and gear driven or not, there really isn't a way of saying one is better than the other. They're both viable technologies. They both work. It's just a design consideration. The other thing that might be happening, if a machine does not have a tail, there is a chance that it could be a machine that is controlled what we call the yaw mechanism which is what allows the machine to swivel or pivot as the wind direction changes if it's something that's controlled by an electrical motor or, or something like that where where it doesn't need to passively align itself with the wind if it's something that's that's being done actively like by a computer and it's being monitored and it's being driven to change its direction in and out of the wind then it wouldn't have a tail either but most commonly in the world of small wind no tail means downwind machine not always but most often moving on to the collectors of the wind turbines so this would be uh, the blades just as a solar panel is a collector because it's a certain area that's subjected to sunlight, so is our wind turbine rotor. The center of the machine or the rotor, what we call the hub, will have three blades or sometimes two, don't want to discriminate, but usually three blades attached to the hub of the machine. So therefore, instead of having a square area, we're now dealing with a circular area as a collector. And area, just to refresh your memory in case it's been a little while, figuring out the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. So radius is one half of of the diameter and I'm gonna get just a little mathy on you here for just a little while and it's only only to prove a point about how much power how much energy you can expect a wind turbine to produce it's not something that is just inherently you know we're not just born with the ability to to look at a wind turbine and know how much energy or power it's going to produce so let's tell you a little bit about that right here I, I promise this is the only math slide I know you didn't sign up for this kind of stuff so bear with me the power available in the wind, P, right, the watts, the power available in the wind is directly proportional to the area of that circle, right, so the size of the collector, and it's also a cube of the velocity or the wind speed. So if you take the area of the circle and you multiply that by the wind speed cubed, and then we also have to add in these two things in here, but, but basically, this is what dictates how much power a wind turbine is going to make. I don't want to just skip over this because it is important, but uh, it's only part of the equation. D here is density 
of the air. So that would remain a constant if you're always working in the same place or in the same state. Well, not always. Uh, if you live in a state where the elevation changes quite a bit, the density is going to change, right? Very different installing a wind turbine in Wisconsin than it would be at, say, 10,000 feet, where the density of the air is just a little bit different. So this is the bottom line. If you double the area of your collector, if you double the size of the circle, you will get twice as much power, right? It's directly proportional. If you double A, you're going to get double P. But if you double the wind speed, V, velocity, if you double the wind speed, because it's a cubic function, you'll get eight times as much power. Okay, so if you double the wind speed, you get eight times as much power. This is why it's so important to put wind turbines on tall towers where the wind resource is, where the fuel is. You'll make more power, you'll make more energy. Drag devices are not used very often in the world of wind turbines, but they're used for lots of other wind devices, very handy, useful wind devices, one of which is an anemometer. Okay, how do we measure the wind speed with an anemometer, which is just composed of a couple of cups that are pushed by the wind. So that's what a drag device is. A drag device is anything that's simply pushed by the wind. And this would inc uh, include windmills, uh, water pumping, grain crushing, farm windmills. At best, you can get about 15% rotor efficiency. Okay, Remember we talked about the BETS limit before, and 59.3% uh, was the ultimate rotor efficiency you could ask for. With a drag device, you're looking at about 15%, which again is great for certain applications though. For low speed, high torque applications, windmills and drag devices are fabulous. Okay? but not for making electricity. For making electricity, we want to use a lift device. Okay? Lift devices, think of bird feathers and airplane wings and anything else that can fly. Right? Lift devices operate at speeds faster than the wind. They're of lighter construction than drag devices, and now we're looking at you know efficiencies sometimes over 50%, but of course not exceeding the BETS limit, because that's impossible, or at least it's been <laughs> proven impossible so far. There was a really great commercial on a couple of years ago, and I was able to find it on YouTube, so I want to take a minute and just watch this with you. And I'm not promoting any particular company, it just gives a nice nice show, a nice uh, difference between what's drag and, and what's lift. And, uh, before we go there though, this is a picture of a, a Whisper 100 blade, and you can see just like a, a bird feather or an airplane wing, uh, the design of that airfoil and how it is indeed a lift device. But uh, first let's have a little fun. Since I subjected you to math earlier, we should have a little fun now and watch a video. Imagine what a pleasant surprise it must have been when men first harnessed the power of wind. At GE, we still believe in wind as a pure, natural source of power. Wind energy from GE, for a cleaner, more fuel-efficient world. GE, imagination at work. So yeah, if any of you watching this primer are uh, pilots or really just enjoy flying or um, maybe even sailing on a sailboat, you probably understand pretty well already the concept of lift and why it's so important that you're lifting, not stalling. <laughs> uh, lift devices, again, this is what we use on wind turbine blades. The blades are constructed usually in, in a similar uh, pattern to this. They're made out of either wood or fiberglass or plastic or sometimes the expensive carbon fiber. It really depends on the size of the machine and how many are are made, what their manufacturing process is, how many they sell. But you'll notice that where we attach the blade here to the hub of the machine, what we call the root, that's our blade root, okay? And then the scoop is sort of the fat part of the blade by the root. As you get to the end of the blade, then you'll notice it narrows out, it tapers until you get to the tip of the blade, okay? The wind is coming from this direction right here. This is what we call the leading edge of the wind turbine, okay? So if you're looking at this machine as we are now, uh, the rotor would spin clockwise. Okay, so the leading edge of the machine is sort of attacking the wind. And you'll see a lot of times because of that there is some leading edge tape that we put on this edge of the blade and it's basically it's almost like helicopter tape just to keep it durable as it's slicing through the air. Then of course the back end of the blade we call that the trailing edge. Okay. 
the working part of the blade, most of the actual energy production is done at the tip of the blade. This is where this is where the good stuff happens right here. But we still need sort of a fatter root of the blade here because that is what gets the turbine spinning in the first place. Right? It sort of starts the rotor in the lower wind speeds, gets it up to speed, and then once it is actually in production mode, this is where most you'll see most of the power and the energy actually doing its work. Notice too again that blades do have a twist and a taper to them. First of all because we want more of a fat area to catch wind and get it going get that starting end moving and other reasons manufacturers may have a significant twister taper might be to reduce maybe some fluttering noises in very high wind speeds if they've got a, a very high RPM machine again design considerations and engineering which we cover in a lot of our other courses at the MREA probably too much to get into right now also we offer a homebrew workshop where you can carve your own wind turbine blades and you can sign up for that as a course and we've also got some lessons at the energy fair. So if you're interested in this sort of twist and taper and how you scoop wind turbine blades, again it's a very it's a it's an aerodynamic kind of a field. Um, so it's it's pretty neat, it's pretty fun. Uh, I've mentioned it once or twice already. Three blades is definitely the most common type of wind turbine on the market, but there's a few good reliable uh, two-bladed machines on the market right now too. Um, two of them come to mind. One of them is, is Gaia Wind. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Some people are still a little hesitant about a two-bladed machine versus a three-bladed machine just simply because some of the the physics involved and the aerodynamics of having a spinning rotor that might be you know straight up and down and completely aligned with the tower therefore if the wind changes direction it would be pretty easy for this machine to yaw which again means like to pivot or to swivel but at times when the blades are in sort of a horizontal uh, position and the rotor is spinning when it gets to this it's, it's a little tough it's a little jagged for the machine to actually turn so you might have some problems with the wind turbine yawing again a balance kind of an issue I'm not saying two-bladed machines are bad because they're not they're just they're a little bit different they have to have at least the guy has like a, what they call a teetered hub uh, to deal with these sort of you know physics uh, of the blades being either you know straight up and down or straight across so it's neat it's different. I like the fact that we've got variety out there now. Without getting too heavy into uh, the electronics and the innards of the machine, let's just talk about some of the basics and wrap up this stuff before we get into towers here. We've got our three blades, our collector, that we're putting onto the machine, the hub of the machine, the nose of the machine. Sometimes there's a little plastic cone just for decoration, make it look pretty, uh, that you can put over the top of that machine. Inside then, typically, at least on this one, you have like a, a permanent magnets and coils of wire so that uh, as they spin electrical a voltage is induced into coils of wire and then they have to go down the tower somehow. Usually the way that's done is through an assembly of uh, slip rings and brushes. This is so that wires don't twist. This is so you can get the electricity to go from this part here to that part here and down the tower without twisting any wires. Carbon brushes ride along these conductive slip rings and uh, are connected internally so that you can just basically transfer the electricity down the tower. And, and again, we want to make sure this is all done smoothly so there's yaw bearings and it really depends on the manufacturer so I don't want to give you too much of always or never here at this point, but that is the basic construction. Okay, we do need to cover also how the machines take care of themselves in high wind speed conditions or any time that they need to you know, change direction with the wind and, and basically how they how they control themselves, uh, speed control, governing. Uh, a couple different options that are out there for wind machines, small wind machines, is furling, and you can either do a side furl or a tilt back furl. There's coning or folding. There's brake tips or spoilers. There's pitching and there's feathering. What we're looking at right here, this particular picture, is a Lakota, and this is a tilt back furling machine. So as the wind speeds increase, okay, this is an upwind machine because it's got a tail, uh, so the winds are coming from the left here, winds are going from the west to the east, and this wind turbine's upwind. As the wind speeds get to be a little bit too much, and this is just done passively, you can see the spring mechanism here, and there's a little weight behind the machine. Uh, behind the generator here, behind the head. Just simply by the force of the wind being so great, this is, it allows the hinge on this rotor to tilt back. 
Okay, and we put dampers and things on here so it doesn't slam back, uh, but it does so in a very controlled and elegant way, right? And again, heavy, heavy springs here, uh, so that say you had a big wind gust and just wham, um, we didn't want it to slam, but it did tilt back. And by tilting back, what this does is it takes the rotor out of being straight into the wind. When the rotor is tilted back, now the wind can just sort of go over the blades instead of the airfoils here and the leading edges and all these aerodynamics we talked about of making lift. Let's get the lift devices out of the wind so they stop lifting, right, and slow the rotor down. So that's one way that a machine can control its speed. Uh, again, it's just a hinge assembly, usually done with heavy-duty springs and a damper so that it can rock back and forth and back and forth if you had some gun days. Then there's also side furling, and I know that it's not as easy to see in the particular picture, but instead of the hinge being on the head of the machine like you see here, we just had that tilt back furling example. So instead of the hinge being here, allowing the machine to tilt back, now the hinge is sort of on the butt of the machine, right? So the hinge is back here on the tail. What this happens then, again, just by the pure, the pure force of the wind being a certain speed, it pushes the collector off to the side and allows now the wind to just flow over the rotor instead of the airfoils attacking the wind directly. Instead of facing directly into the wind, it pushed so hard it was enough to operate the spring and the machine furled to the side, allowing the wind to just float over it and it slows down the collector. So that is how we control uh, the wind speeds if it's a furling machine. Here's a picture of a Whisper 100 while it's furling. So uh, again, the way to see this best is on gusty days. Windy days definitely, of course, but also gusty if you had, you know, 20 mile an hour winds regularly, but then they were gusting up to 40 miles an hour. If you walk outside and look underneath the machine, you'll probably be able to see the tail kind of kick into the side and, and, and going back and kick into the side and going back to control the speed of the rotor so it doesn't overproduce and cause troubles. Some machines, for example, the Proven, which has currently been bought by Kingspan, this is a very unique design machine. First of all, it's a downwind machine, so you can see in the picture that there is no tail on this machine. So the wind is coming again from the west and going to the east and hitting your your rotor, your collector here. And, and you can see in this picture here, it's almost like origami. These blades actually fold into themselves. If the wind speeds are too strong, this collector is actually allowed to shrink up into like a badminton cone. So the force of the wind causes these different folds in the blades to sort of collapse on, on, on each other. They don't, they don't, of course, collapse as in they you know, fall off or touch each other. Uh, but it shrinks the size of the collector into a cone while folding the blades. So that obviously then slows down the rotor and stops production because you just shrunk your collector significantly. Another way, and these are typically with a little bit bigger small wind machines, so you're looking probably in about the 50 kilowatt to 100 kilowatt range here. Some machines have been manufactured with what we call tip brakes, or <laughs> they look like feet, so I've just always called them feet. Uh, spoilers. Under normal conditions, right, the, the, the wind turbine is spinning in this direction, okay, that's going counterclockwise. The feet are aerodynamic in a sense, so they just stay where they're at when the rotor's spinning at a normal speed. But when it's going too fast, say the wind speed really kicked up and you got a big gust of wind, these are on hinges, so they're allowed to pop out and basically act as drag devices to slow the rotor down. Now hopefully, if you're having a good day and these feet pop out because they need to slow the turbine down, hopefully they just pop back in as easily as they popped out. There's little magnets, there's little spring clips, there's lots of mechanical little gizmos on the ends of these tip brakes. So for those of us who have had machines and worked on machines with tip brakes, it kind of just you know, makes you kind of squinch up your nose a little bit because you know that if something goes wrong with these tip brakes, you're going to have to service them. And I think you can tell by the pictures, they're not the easiest parts of the wind turbine to service. They require a little extra special couple steps and parts and, and courage. So they're interesting and probably not, in case you can't tell, not my preferred method of speed control. Here's something really cool, uh, pitching and feathering. 
which is used a lot on Jacobs designed turbines uh, sold by Wind Turbine Industries uh, Corporation in Minnesota. The Jacobs design has been around since the turn of the century and I don't mean the century we're in right now I mean the century before that. So really neat design it's been tested and, and, and proven to be fantastic and uh, long life over the many years that they've been running but you can see again these heavy-duty springs holding the hub of this machine. The, the blades are attached, of course, to the hub of the machine, right? We call this the whole spider assembly. And what happens is as the wind speeds, this is an upwind machine with a tail. So again, our wind is coming from the west going to the east. If the wind speeds get to be a little bit too strong, this whole rotor assembly, all three blades are connected together with the spring assembly so that they kind of pop in an outward direction and cause the blades to be at a little bit more of an angle for drag versus lift. So again, just the sheer strength of the wind, and that's also determined by how much tension you put on these springs as they go through their tie rods. But depending on how much you tension up these springs, you can control all three blades will simultaneously either kind of pop out into a drag position or scoot back into operating position where they're lift devices. So it's kind of hard to show you without an actual you know, video or having you here, but it is another method in which wind, wind turbines can control their speeds. Last but not least, the towers. Towers are a very important part of your wind energy system. They should not be overlooked and you should not skimp on them. Oh, that's right, tower. The tower is probably going to be the most expensive part of your system. Don't be surprised if it costs about half of your total system cost. You're looking at a lot of steel Okay, and iron and, and metal and you're looking at a big foundation of concrete and a lot of metal and copper and rebar and stuff that has to go into that concrete. So Clay's original presentation says, you know, expect at least that to be about a third of your total system cost. I'm going to up that ante and say expect that to be a, about half of your total system cost. But it's such an important part of the, the system. It, of course, you know, resists toppling like a big lever does or a big lever, depending on which way you like to pronounce that. But you should not skimp. It is so important because you want the wind turbine to go where the fuel is. And if you skimp and get a short tower because you don't like the cost of it, well, now you're not going to make nearly as much energy. So what happens to your rate of return, you know, there? You know, you can make a lot of energy up here. You can make mediocre energy down here. Well, I'd rather make a lot of energy. Pay the thing off a lot faster, right? So a couple different types of towers that are out there. One is called a freestanding tower. And this is a lattice style tower. It's climbable. It's got a very small footprint, right? And just a tiny little piece there. It's installed with a crane, but it's also because of that heavy foundation and the sleekness of it and the small footprint, it is the most expensive type of tower on the market. There's another type of freestanding tower called a monopole, which is just a pole, a big steel pole. And that's what large wind turbines and wind farm equipment are put on. But some small wind turbines are also put on monopoles, usually by the customer's request because they like the way that they look. But you'll, you'll definitely pay for it. The freestanding towers, they do cost the most. So here's a couple real-life photos of wind turbines on freestanding towers. Both of these are lattice style. On the one on the left is apparently some sort of an installation day. This is out at Marvecker's Farm near Chilton. And then on the right we've got uh, Fran Cherney's Jacobs machine pretty close to the MREA. This is a 35 kilowatt single phase Vestas machine and again this over here is a Jacobs machine. I think it's the 17.5 kilowatt rated machine. Then there is a guide lattice tower. This is usually the least expensive type of tower on the market. It comes in modular sections. You still I don't want to say need a crane, but it's usually installed with a crane. If you're in an area where a crane can't get in, or if you're just hardcore and old school, uh, it is possible, almost like cell phone tower climbers, to uh, to climb up each section, assemble, and, and then pull up with like a, a pulley system and block and tackle system and pull up the next section and mount that and then climb up there and then use a gin pole and a pulley system to get the next part out there. But most of us usually use a crane wherever it's possible. But it is climbable, not a tilting tower or anything like that. This is just one that's held up with guy wires. So you need to, of course, make sure that these guy wires are checked out on a regular basis, that they're properly tensioned so that the tower doesn't buckle. The guy radius is what usually turns people off 
about these particular types of towers because they are at anywhere between 50% to 80% of your total tower height. So that's that's a pretty big footprint. And of course, if you live in an area where there's snowmobilers or hunters or anybody going to be wandering around outside, uh, make sure you mark these really well. Here's just kind of a picture looking at the bottom of the tower and then up. This was an installation the MREA did in 2005, giving you a couple different angles. And you can see how these brackets, these guy brackets, kind of attach together. And then your wires get coupled to those brackets. And then they have to be pulled taut uh, and tensioned properly and set with turnbuckles and anchor clips. And you can see a whole there's a whole lot of hardware and technique to putting up a guide tower. This is not just sort of a plug-and-play, do-it-yourself kind of a system. You really need to be careful because one loose guy wire and you've got a tower on the ground. So it's very, very important to make sure you know what you're doing with those guy wires. Even more so <laughs> is a tilt-up tower. Cost-wise, tilt-up is probably somewhere right in between the freestanding and the guide tower. This is a picture, or I should say just a drawing, of, of a wind turbine on a tilt-up tower in the operating position, right? So mid-range cost, it's assembled with pipe, usually about a Schedule 40 pipe. It is not a climbable tower as, well, anything's possible, but you should not attempt to climb a tilt-up tower. It's not made for climbing. The guy radius is a little bit less sometimes than a, a standard guide tower, but it still does uh, require a pretty big footprint, uh, along with the fact that you're going to have a gin pole that is used and usually stays outside uh, for when you're ready to tilt it down. Notice it's just basically a big lever. Uh, in the next pictures here, you're going to see what we do with this lever, is that when it comes time to service the machine, or, or, or take it out of service for whatever reason, we have to, in a very controlled way, get this gin pole, raise that gin pole up so that it tilts the machine down. This is not easy. This is a lot of physics happening all at one time. There's a lot of, you can see all the different sets of guy wires. There's four sets of guy wires at different heights along the tower sections here. So it is not, and anyone can do it, do it yourself, simple, easy, put it up in a day uh, kind of tower. A lot of times they're marketed this way. Oh, you don't want to climb just get yourself a tilt-up tower. Tilt-up towers, at least in my professional experience, are scarier than climbing a machine. I would personally rather climb a machine, uh, but you know, for certain applications, tilt-ups are fantastic. You just, you really have to make sure you have an experienced crew that knows what they're doing. Again, there's so many physics in play. Here, uh, from a bird's eye view, is what your footprint would look like for a tilt-up tower. It's almost like a kite. Okay, so you've got the turbine in the center of the kite here, the tower base. So when the turbine is laying down, when you take it down, it's coming all the way out here. But you've got your four guy anchor points. Okay, so you need four guy anchor points because as you're tilting it's almost like this is your pivot point. This is keeping the turbine straight from left to right as you're tilting up and bringing it down. Uh, you can't get that same kind of control if you only had three anchor points like you see on a standard fixed guide tower uh, because that's not tilting up and down, that's just staying in place. You can you can get away with having three three anchor points, but on a tilt-up tower you've got to have four anchor points. And remember that the turbine's going to come out all the way out to the end when it's down. Freestanding tower, by comparison, very tiny footprint, obviously, because <laughs> if there's a tiny f a footprint, there must be something else going on, right? You bet there's something else going on. It's a lot of concrete in the ground. This is the foundation for the 20 kilowatt Jacobs machine at the MREA here on our campus. So you can see, you know, it makes about six feet tall, maybe not even quite that tall, maybe like 5'10". So there's one, two, at least three of him going on these sauna tubes that are going to get filled full of concrete. And then there's going to be even more concrete, you know, poured all the way around this thing, yards and yards of concrete. And that is very important, obviously. We don't want the tower to collapse. So having a tiny footprint means having a lot of concrete underneath the base of the tower. All right, we're going to switch gears for just one slide because there's a whole other set of curriculum to take regarding siting. Wind turbine site assessment, wind energy site assessment, there's a lot 
to know. It's it's very different than solar site assessment of finding where the sun is going to be at certain points of the day. We have to look at, you know, your surroundings, your vegetation, your buildings, and then even off into your neighbor's areas and your topography and where there's tree lines and all sorts of things uh, that go into siting a wind turbine properly. I think I've mentioned a few times, at least I hope I have, that wind turbines should be up on tall towers in the air where the fuel is. The rule of thumb basic is to keep the bottom of your collector, the bottom of your rotor, at least 30 feet above anything that's obstructing it within 500 feet. Remember that when you're looking at your trees, they grow and towers don't, so you want to look at mature tree height and keep the bottom of that rotor at least 30 feet above that. Avoid being downwind of a large tree line. Okay. Avoid being in any low-lying areas. If you're next to a, a riverbed or a stream or a creek, that's a pretty good giveaway that you're in a low-lying area and it's probably not a good place to put a wind turbine. Uh, if you live very close to an airport, you've probably got some FAA restrictions. And of course, you'll need to check with your local ordinances and your local laws regarding towers and installations. So you might have a, a town, a county, village, state law. Uh, to deal with or an ordinance to deal with so you have to check with with that okay and I know at this point because this is meant to be an introductory very introductory class you've got lots of questions either you've decided wind is not something that you're interested in anymore or you've decided you've got a lot more that you want to know and I'm hoping it's the latter how much do these systems cost I just listened to this woman for how long and she didn't say she didn't give me any numbers no, I didn't. There's a reason I didn't give you numbers. There's too many variables. There's too much to talk about, and I can't just throw you numbers in a quick one-hour primer course. You're going to have to come back. You're going to have to come to the Energy Fair. We're going to have to look at your site. We're going to have to talk about options. It's just the way it is. The selection on the market. Hey, you know, you showed me these pictures of these other turbines. Are they still out there? Again, how much do they cost? Who makes them? Which ones are U.S. made? There's a lot of different types out there, right? Uh, and, and we talked about siting and resource assessment and how to figure out, you know, how tall your tower needs to be, if this is a good place or not. What about all the electrical fun stuff? All of that, you know, connecting to the grid, battery systems, inverters we talked about. What about all that electrical stuff? That's a whole other set of courses. Climbing, safety, installing, maintaining. I want to look at these slip ring assemblies, and I want to check brushes, and I want to climb on, on a machine and learn how to do that. We do that here. We do all this stuff here. So come here, take more courses, come to the Energy Fair around the summer solstice in June. Every year, fifteen to 20,000 people come to our Energy Fair, and I encourage you to do the same. So the last thing we'll do with this course is go on a virtual field trip. I'll be your host. We'll walk around, and we'll take a look at our three machines that we've got on our campus here at the Renew the Earth Institute in Custer. We've got a what used to be a 20 kilowatt machine that's been modified to a 17.5 kilowatt original Jacobs Design wind turbine. We've also got another Jacobs Design 3.6 kilowatt machine, which is called a Long Case Jake, as well as a 10-foot homebrew machine where, again, I mentioned you can carve your own blades and, and make your own machine. We've got one here, a 10-foot machine, which, if it had an industry rating, would probably be around 500 watts. Okay, well, I'll finish off with my work cited here, so you can see I didn't steal anything from anybody I shouldn't have. I want to thank you very much for your time and again encourage you to come to the MREA and learn more. Thanks everyone.